Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, Chad's president says that he's confident he'll be returned for another term after Sunday's elections, but many skeptical of the transparency of polls have struggled to get the word out because of an online blackout. Also, Ivorians in the seaside resort of Grand Bassam are still shaken by the memory of last month's bloodshed. It became the site of the country's first ever terror attack, and the tourists upon which locals rely are still staying away. And we hear from a Kenyan cartoonist who insists that the might of his pen will not be silenced. Known as Gado, the caricaturist has made a career of poking fun at the country's political elite, but has seen work at a top newspaper dry up. He says that's no coincidence. Well, first, it's been tough going for those in Chad hoping to compare notes on Sunday's presidential elections. An online blackout prevented many from discussing the polls, which are expected to see President Idris Deby extend his 26-year rule. Mobile internet was suspended from Sunday morning, later followed by fixed networks. Even text messages struggled to get through. Officials have yet to explain the shutdown. It happened during Congo Brazzaville's presidential election last month, and now the same scenario is taking place in Chad. Here also the authorities have decided to cut off the internet and text messages. It means opposition supporters can't discuss how the voting went. But very quickly, one of the incumbent's main rivals said there had been widespread fraud. Here in the capital, for example, many voter cards were bought, 20 to 50,000 francs each. We have witnesses. This shows the authorities set aside a huge budget to cheat. But none of this will stop the Chadian people's will. Idris Deby has been ruling Chad for 26 years. He's seeking a fifth mandate. He has many more means than the 12 other candidates and appeared optimistic. Politicians must, in the most sincere and honest way possible, accept the results, accept what the people have decided. Dibi is appreciated by Western powers because Chad's army plays an important role in the struggle against jihadists, be it in Nigeria or northern Mali. But he's also criticized by human rights organizations. Last month, several leaders of Chad's civil society were put in prison after they called for demonstrations against the man who's been in power for more than a quarter of a century. Look now at some news in brief. At least five people, including children, were killed when a car bomb exploded near government buildings in Mogadishu on Monday. Somali extremist group Al-Shabaab's claimed responsibility for the attack. The violence comes just two days after another explosive killed three people in the capital. Al-Shabaab's behind a campaign of attacks against state officials and international troops. Monday also saw the Somali government announce the execution of a former journalist linked to Al-Shabaab. Hassan Hanafi Haji was convicted over the murders of five Somali journalists. He was killed by firing squad at the Mogadishu Police Academy after being extradited from Kenya. Haji had been the media liaison for the jihadist group. And residents in Darfur began voting on Monday in a referendum on whether to unify the region's five states. The plebiscite has met with international criticism, with the U.S. warning that the exercise risks undermining the peace process and is unlikely to be fair. Khartoum split up Darfur to dilute the power of local tribes, and the move was a big factor in fighting that erupted in 2003 and led to the deaths of around 300,000 people. Well, almost one month on since it became the site of Ivory Coast's first terror attack, the little town of Grand Bassam is shakily getting back on its feet. It's long relied on the local and overseas visitors who come in and spend money whilst enjoying its picturesque beaches. But after 19 people were shot dead on the sands in March, the resort's residents are struggling to put the violence behind them. In Grand Bassam, swimsuits have replaced the police cordons, but visitors are yet to return. On the beach, there are more sellers than tourists. A month after the attacks, Grand Bassam is a different town. Nothing is working. No one's coming to the beach. It's very difficult. On a Saturday or a Sunday, I could earn between five and 10,000 francs. Yesterday, I only made 500. 
L'Etoile du Sud, one of the hotels hit in the attacks, wanted to reopen immediately. But here, like all the restaurants along the seaside, tables are almost empty. The occupancy rate has dropped from 80 to 3%. When you come to L'Etoile du Sud, you normally have to fight for the sun loungers. All of them are usually taken. People come early to get the best places, the best sunbeds. But now there's no one. It shows there's still fear out there. People are a little hesitant, but we have hope. We will carry on as normal and hope that they will come. The Ivorian government has promised 200 million francs CEFA to help Bassam. Security has been strengthened, police officers patrol the streets and the few customers who still come want to help the town recover. There's no reason not to come. Everything's safe. For me, I think there's no problem. I think that by not coming, people are supporting the terrorists because that's what they want, to scare people off. Nobody here can forget, but a month after the attacks, hotel owners, residents and artists are all determined to recover. Well, Zambian opposition politician Jeffrey Mwamba went on trial on Monday for allegedly threatening violence against President Edgar Lungu. Popularly known as GBM, his case was adjourned until May to allow the defence to file their submissions. Now, Mwamba is the vice president of the opposition UPND and was charged after he said that he would go for President Lungu's throat in elections in August. His legal team wants the matter referred to the Constitutional Court, arguing that he did not commit a criminal offence as he was speaking figuratively. Godfrey Mwan Penboa, pen name Gado, has long been Kenya's most famous cartoonist. After 23 years of poking fun at the political elite with his sketches, the Daily Nation newspaper, with which he's long worked, says that his services are no longer required. Now, he says it's proof of a state crackdown on press freedoms. This comes amidst a series of alleged moves to silence critical journalists, as our Duncan Woodside reports. Is something of an institution here in Kenya. His sketches in the privately owned Nation newspaper, a feature of daily life for nearly a quarter of a century, a chance for Kenyans to laugh at their political masters. This is January last year, which I compared the pres president Uhuru to the emperor without cloth. But after a short sabbatical, his contract with the paper hasn't been renewed. He claims the decision is due to pressure from State House. There's no question that the pressure has gotten, uh, the pressure got its way. We have seen um, an administration that is trying to roll back the, uh, the gains that um, Kenya has made. He's just one of several people so far this year, including a senior editor who wrote an opinion piece criticizing President Uhuru Kenyatta's performance, who've fallen foul of the paper's management. The newspaper insists the departures are totally unrelated to alleged pressure from the authorities. The question of departures of people from, from the nation is uh, purely um, a HR issue. Uh, contracts uh, ended uh, in, in some cases, uh, and in some cases uh, assignments uh, were, were restructured. State House claims it exerts no pressure whatsoever on private media in Kenya. Uh, the, the allegations are uh, absolute rubbish. Uh, we live in a country in which freedom of expression is not in dispute. We probably have the freest media on the African continent. Gado isn't going hungry. He's getting other offers of work, including from an international news agency. A new creation, a sketch of Uganda's freshly re-elected President Yari Museveni having nightmares that he'll end up meeting the same miserable fate as Libya's Colonel Gaddafi. Well, that's it for Eye on Africa. Thanks very much for joining us and please do so again if you can. Take care.